Welcome to History's Influence. When we think of Spain and Portugal, we think of two Catholic nations, known historically for their vast overseas empires. However, this was not always the case. Both nations were born in the flames of the Reconquista, in which Christian kingdoms fought against Islamic caliphates and emirates to retake the Iberian Peninsula for Christianity. But this didn't have to happen. What if the Christian Reconquista had failed? Would the peninsula remain an Islamic one? What would the future of Iberia be? How would the Islamic and Christian worlds manage this new situation? Would there still be overseas empires ruled from Iberia or from Europe at all? All of these questions and more will be answered in this alternate history. To begin, let's explain why the Reconquista happened in the first place. The Iberian Peninsula was a province of the Roman Empire, known as Hispania, where the name for Spain comes from. Most of its inhabitants came to speak Latin, whose modern descendants are known as the Romance languages. Hispania also adopted Christianity, alongside the rest of the empire. When the Western Roman Empire collapsed, Hispania fell under Germanic barbarian rule. It was the Visigoths who eventually controlled all of Iberia. Over the centuries, they had largely assimilated with the local peoples. However, by the 8th century, the Visigoth kingdom had become weak and ineffective, with tensions between nobles who were fighting over the throne. Like other barbarian kingdoms, they didn't sort out a stable succession law to follow, so internal strife would occur whenever a monarch would pass away. Whilst this kingdom was struggling to maintain itself, a new threat was on the horizon. The emergence of Islam in Arabia was quickly followed by one of the most important events in history, the Arab conquests, beginning in the 7th century. The Prophet Muhammad united Arabia and his successor states of the Rashidun and Umayyad caliphates stretched Islamic control from modern Morocco to the west to modern Pakistan in the east. However, their western conquests did not finish in Morocco. Fighting against the weak Visigoths, the Umayyad Caliphate conquered nearly all of Iberia, renaming the peninsula Al-Andalus, likely coming from the name of the Vandals. The Christians weren't completely defeated, however. A Visigothic nobleman established the Kingdom of Asturias in the northwestern mountains after defeating the Umayyads at the Battle of Kobadonga from around 718 to 722 AD. This marked the beginning of the Christian Reconquista. Al-Andalus splintered from the later Abbasid Caliphate to establish an independent emirate of Cordoba, later declaring itself the Caliphate of Cordoba, which in both stages ushered a golden age of culture and technology in the area. The golden age was centered in the city of Cordoba, which was the largest city in Europe at the time. However, Asturias and its successor states, alongside help from the Frankish, slowly reconquered Iberia. When the Caliphate of Cordoba had collapsed, it splintered into a series of Taifa states, who were soon replaced by North African occupation. But none of these Muslim states were able to prevent a successful reconquista. The Emirate of Granada survived as the final Muslim state in Iberia, finally collapsing in 1492 at the hands of a united Spain, ending over 700 years of Muslim occupation in Iberia. In order to prevent the Reconquista, we're going to assume that the Muslims successfully defeat the Christians at the Battle of Covadonga in 718-722. We will assume that the Christians of this northern region aren't able to mount a successful defense and instead submit to Muslim rule. This would prevent the Visigothic nobleman Pelagius from establishing the Kingdom of Asturias, initiating the Reconquista. It is important to note that the Reconquista was not only performed by the Iberians. The Franks, after beating back the Arabs at the Battle of Tours, later conquered part of northeastern Spain, which became the Spanish March, a march being a military buffer zone. I think the Arabs would still fail in conquering lands from the Franks beforehand. They were too strong and the Arabs were too far from their original homeland. They only raided the region in our own timeline, so I believe the same will occur in this new timeline with similar outcomes. 
It was the legendary and powerful Emperor Charlemagne who had conquered the Spanish March, so I don't believe the Arabs conquering the rest of Iberia could really prevent this conquest from occurring. However, the March had become decentralized from Frankish rule, thanks largely to Frankish feudalism. In the 9th century, the independent kingdoms of Navarre, Aragon and Barcelona had declared independence. At this point in our own timeline, the Cordobans were starting to weaken, having land chipped away by Asturias and its successor states. In this new timeline, the Emirate of Cordoba isn't going to be as weak, holding onto Iberia securely. Therefore, the Muslims will be able to reconquer the independent March states. But will the Emirate still fracture into numerous Taifa eventually? I believe it was inevitable. The Emirate of Cordoba, during its zenith, did declare itself a caliphate in 929, claiming to be the rightful successor to the previous caliphates and the Prophet Muhammad by extension. But by 1031, the caliphate had weakened and collapsed. Advisors rather than the caliph held most of the political power, and an over-reliance on mercenaries led to a North African Berber company sacking the city of Cordoba. This was the final straw which broke the Arabian camel's back. <laughs> Small estates known as Taifas emerged from the rubble. I don't think these symptoms of decay would change in this new timeline, but I think it would take longer, perhaps a few decades or a century, since less resources would be needed to defend against the Reconquista. By the Taifa period in our timeline, the majority of Muslim Iberia had converted to Islam. The Cordobans were quite tolerant to Christians, but conversion to Islam became rapid around the time the Caliphate was declared. As a result, I don't believe native rebellion will lead to the re-establishment of any Christian states. Additionally, the Franks had become weak and decentralized, so I don't believe they would conquer parts of Spain either. They couldn't retake the March states after all. In our own timeline, the Taifa period allowed for the Christian kingdoms to conquer more Islamic land in Iberia. But in this new timeline, without Christian states conquering land, the Taifas will slowly begin to enlarge and grow in size. This happened to a small extent in our own timeline, but it wasn't effective enough to defend against the Christians. The Taifas decided instead to invite the North African Empire of the Almorphids to invade, who united Muslim Iberia under their rule and held back the Christian advance. We're going to assume the Almorphids will still invade Al-Andalus, due to its weakened state and wealthy lands, it would be too tempting to avoid. It's important to note that Arabs and Berbers have been migrating into the region for centuries. In fact, numerous Taifas were actually led by Berbers. About 10% of Al-Andalus's population was estimated to be Berber at a certain point, not to mention the smaller minority of Arabs who had migrated into the peninsula, so they were a substantial force. In this new timeline, Taifas in the northern regions particularly where Christian states existed at this point in our timeline, would begin to unite under the threat of the Amorphorids, a similar pattern we see with small states against large ones in history. These Iberians would become too well defended in terms of distance and mountainous geography for the North Africans to successfully conquer them. The Northern Iberians and Moors will continue to convert Iberia to Islam. The United Northern Iberian Emirate would have less Arabic and Berber admixture than the South due to geographic separation and also less economic relevancy. I believe this dynamic will cause the native Iberians to become the dominant group in the region. It's likely the Taifas of the North would initially be led by Arabs, Berbers and even Slavs who were ex-slaves brought into the region. These groups led Taifas in our own timeline after all. But over time they would assimilate into the Iberian culture of the region. It's important to note that many of the Berbers spoke Arabic and brought more of this language into Al-Andalus. The predominant language in the Northern Emirate would become Iberian Romance however, the root language of modern Spanish and Portuguese in our timeline. The dialects of most of the peninsula would be fairly similar at this point, without the distinct histories of the Reconquista existing creating sort of different dialects. Catalonian would still exist as a separate language however, likely remaining as a minority language in the areas of the previous Spanish March. I believe they would remain a distinct region for the rest of the timeline, but would still convert to Islam. 
the North Iberians would eventually kick out the Berbers and reunite Iberia. This would cause the Berbers to lose cultural and linguistic relevancy. It would sort of be like the Reconquista, but without the religious undertones. In our timeline, Muslim Iberia had three linguistic stages, a monolingual Iberian Romance, to a bilingual stage introducing Arabic, followed by a monolingual Arabic in the Emirate of Granada. Arabs and Arabized Berbers continued to move south during the Christian Reconquista, increasing their population density and thereby cementing the shift into Arabic in the south. In this new timeline, the Arabs will instead be dispersed across a larger portion of the peninsula. So even southern Iberia won't be as Arabic as it was in our own timeline. Additionally, with the Berbers being kicked out by the North Iberians, many Arabic speakers would flee. Over time, being small in numbers, they would simply assimilate. The Iberians would still call the peninsula Al-Andalus, however, sort of a remnant of their Islamic heritage. In fact, 8% of modern Spanish words come from Arabic, so I'd say a substantial Arabic influence would be still present in this new timeline, considering the adoption of Islam, more so than this 8% actually. But none of what I'm saying is for certain. Ethnic, religious and linguistic estimates of Iberia during the Reconquista aren't agreed upon by academics. So I may be wrong, and Iberia may be firmly Arabized, but I believe I've justified my view well enough, given the lack of evidence. The Jewish population of Al-Andalus would also be important to mention. In our own timeline, the Spanish expelled them after the Reconquista. This isn't going to happen in the new timeline. They would still be oppressed by the Almorphrids like in our timeline, so they'd want to support the Northern Iberians in overthrowing North African rule. This would place them on good terms with the Iberians, similar to their prosperity under Cordoba. My gut feeling is that they stay as a tolerated minority which will be reduced in number, similar to their dynamic in other Muslim countries of the time. The Christians instead will be assimilated over time. Or well, perhaps a minority, like the Coptic Christians in Muslim Egypt will still exist, but they won't be relevant to the country's future. So now we have a majority Muslim, Romance-speaking Iberia, which will be reinvigorated and reunited by a strong emirate. Will this nation last? Most Islamic regions did not have long-lasting states, instead larger empires or different dynasties would create new states. However, the foundations of the new regime would be religiously and linguistically homogenous, which lend towards the idea of longevity. Their identity will be clear against their enemies of the Berbers and the Franks. You could argue due to their non-Arabic culture, they would have an easier time staying united, similar to how the Turks or Persians were able to form stable countries in our timeline. The regime will be secure, but how would Al-Andalus fare in the early modern period? A key question would be if Al-Andalus will colonize an overseas empire similar to the Spanish or Portuguese. 1492 marked the fall of Granada in our timeline, but it also marked the beginning of European colonialism when Christopher Columbus discovered the Americas for Spain. He was an Italian merchant from the Republic of Genoa, appealing to fellow Christian monarchs. In this new timeline, he isn't going to be asking a Muslim Al-Andalus for help. Assuming he still exists, Columbus will simply petition nations such as England or France instead. This means initially, we're going to see other powers colonizing like the Spanish and Portuguese did. Perhaps nations such as the Danish and Swedish are going to be given better chances without the early Spanish and Portuguese competition. This would drastically change who colonizes what. I believe the English would be the first to colonize, so it's possible they may conquer the Aztecs and the Incans, for example. Their administration of these areas compared to the historical Spanish administration could have a massive impact on how these areas turn out. The Portuguese domination of the Indian Ocean spice trade may be mirrored by another power, perhaps the Dutch, who stole it from Portugal historically. This would cause major geopolitical issues for Al-Andalus. With the stronger England and France, we're going to see a power imbalance that disfavors Iberia. The opposite happened in our own timeline, where the influx of New World Gold took away France's status as the premier European power and gave it to Spain. This 
alongside stories of wealth from the Aztecs and Incans, will be enough to motivate Al Andalus to eventually begin colonization, albeit at a later stage. As a result, they're going to find less success than the earlier Christians. The nearby Azores and Canaries will be colonized by the Christians, presumably the English, posing a noticeable threat to Iberian safety. The Andalusians will secure more land in North Africa and attempt to take portions of the Americas and potentially West Africa. They will compete with the Ottomans in North Africa like the Spanish did, or perhaps come to a more peaceable agreement as fellow Muslims. This would prevent the Moroccans from being able to colonize, like what happened in our own timeline. As populated areas such as Mesoamerica and Peru will be conquered already, it's likely the Iberians are going to focus on settlement-based colonies in the New World. It's also likely they would have cash crops farmed by African slaves, given that Muslim Iberia took part heavily in the sub-Saharan slave trade historically. A mix of both types of settlement may occur in different regions, like with the American North or the American South in our timeline. Or it's possible we may see a situation like Brazil, where both forms of settlement occur in the same sort of area. This would mean areas such as the historical 13 colonies, the La Pampa region, or Brazil, would be ideal locations for Andalusian settlements. The Iberians would still be left behind in this colonial race. This would become more noticeable as the Christian world's technological advancements would rapidly increase. I believe later colonial occurrences, such as the subjugation of India, or the scramble for Africa, won't be events the Andalusians would take part in. I'm skeptical the Andalusians would be outright colonized by Christians in a later period. They weren't that disconnected from the Christian civilization next to their border. Spain not existing has pretty large geopolitical implications as well. For example, the Netherlands or large parts of Italy were owned by the Spanish. I believe they would both be competed for by the French and Austrians instead. Malta, for example, may be taken by the Ottomans. The Spanish helped prevent the siege, but it's possible the al Andalusians would assist the Ottomans instead. Or perhaps whoever else rules South Italy defends the island. If the Andalusians and Ottomans enter an alliance, it would be big trouble for Europe, similar to the Franco-Ottoman alliance in our own timeline. This could seriously challenge the continent, although I believe the Christians would unite to prevent any such drastic conquests from occurring. The Ottomans will eventually become overstretched as they did in our timeline, and the al Andalusians would have a powerful France on their border. If the Protestant Reformation occurs, without a strong Spain to help the Catholic cause, the Protestants may be more successful in spreading their message. It's also important to mention that the Reformation may not even occur due to the close threat of Muslims by the Pyrenees. Whatever the case, it's clear broadly speaking that the whole dynamic of Europe is going to change a lot. Perhaps Al Andalus will play European powers against each other to prevent, say, France from getting too powerful. Moving down south, I believe the Islamic world would likely follow a similar trajectory as in our timeline, but perhaps with more technological advancements being adopted from Al Andalus. But it's not like the Muslim nations were drastically behind the Christian Europeans in the early modern period. It was more with industrialization that the tide began to shift drastically. It would be interesting to see how Andalus would fare into the modern period. It may turn into a success story like Turkey, ignoring the inflation, <laughs> or it may struggle to thrive in a world dominated by their Christian European counterparts. This video has gotten speculative enough already, so I don't really want to stretch it further. We'll leave it there. I would appreciate your thoughts on this video, both on the timeline itself and the quality of the video. This has been History's Influence. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Catch you later.